Hello. <laughs> so, uh, welcome everybody. Seems like uh, we've got more than a full complement, which is great. Um, there are only three items. One of those, of course, is the confirmation of minutes, uh, which is starred. Um, so, unless anyone wanted to unstar that for any reason. No, that's good. Um, conflicts of interest, I don't believe that we have any. So, no, that's all good. So, um, what I might do is uh, actually get someone to move that starred item, if I can. Councillor Tozer, second to Councillor Taylor. Um, take the vote on that. All those in favour, that is carried. We've got two items. Um, for a change, they're both in open. Look at that. So, the viewers are going to get lucky. This is going to be really fantastic that you can tune into this. Uh, there we go. Um, firstly, the draft economic strategy. 22 to 27, um, would you like a presentation? You would like a presentation, so okay. So through you, Mr Chair, the presentation, we will just have the one page document up on the screen and Nick's happy to go through it and then we're happy to answer any questions. I think you've seen most of this over the I time. I think we have, and I know too that um, you engaged, I believe you engaged with every councillor on this anyway, so yeah, yep. you did. So I think it's something that we're... We're all across. Councillor Owen Jones. I just ask a question in regards to engagement and coordination. So on page 19 is the usual coordination and consultation page. Um, and it appears to be silent in regards to the CEO and also the Mayor's office. Are we to take that as having had happen? Uh, through you, Mr Chair, we have engaged there. We've also engaged in ELT, so it's been taken through ELT. Uh, we, I think there were some changes originally, Nick, at ELT, which we did update and, and change, so that, that forms part of this. So It's probably important there too, Councillor and Jones, to say that corporate planning and performance, so Sarah Wilton and her team from a council plan, um, they have been with this process through us through the whole through the whole time and have obviously assisted us to bring the structure and I think the formatting that you can see there to be aligned to to the council plan which council endorsed not too long ago. Yeah. And I think yeah. uh, through you Mr Chair if it's okay I think also there was there's a comment in there that says that we engage with a, an extensive list of internal and external stakeholders uh, and it may have been an error on my behalf but I really just listed the internal stakeholders but there was there was pro there was three external workshops that we facilitated uh, there was about 100 people that participated in those workshops there was an internal stakeholder workshop that included a number of different departments from across the organization that all have some sort of a, a linkage to the economic strategy and as Alicia mentioned uh, we presented uh, on at least one occasion to ELT to seek their endorsement and then um, the, the recommendation or the endorsement that we got from ELT was that they, that was at the time before the new CEO had started and so the ELT asked us to present it to the new CEO for his advice before bringing it to committee and at the time um, the CEO with council's support made the decision to put future strategies on hold pending the outcome of the development of the council plan. So this document or the draft of this document was the longer form version of this document was essentially completed in around about January this year but then we put it on hold pending the outcome of the council plan. Once the council plan was endorsed we've now brought this back for council's consideration so I wasn't going to talk too much through the details, it was more about just to explain that process, the engagement process that we've been through, um, the conversations that we've had and then happy to take any questions. I think, you know, as you'll see on that slide there, the first two components around sustainable economic future and talented, they've got asterisks next to them because they're directly aligned to the council plan. So they've all already essentially been endorsed as is as part of the council plan. And then the other two are the other two key priority areas that emerged through the engagement process around connected and high performance, which again, I'm really happy to answer any questions about any of that. Yeah. Councillor McDonald, yeah. It's probably good to, um, you, you know, for the general public reading this, um, so that they know that um, the community have been consulted and who's been consulted. So I'd just like to suggest, Mr Chair, for future, or, or even if it can be included here, um, but it's made quite clear um, the groups and um, officers that have been uh, involved in this consultation. Through you, Mr Chair, we're happy to do a list, Council McDonald, and include that in the minutes too, so we can we can yes. do that. 
So, councillors, any questions of Nick or Tanya or anything? Oh, yes, councillor. Councillor Hamill. Um, I might jump to specific ones in the actions, Mr. Chair, just for ease and so the overall content. So, I was interested on page 36. It identifies an action of develop an international economic development plan to identify opportunities to diversify across new and existing global markets. Um, I was looking for a, a bit of a detail around what that might look like or what the thought process behind that one was. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Councillor Hamill. So the, the thinking there is that, um, for example, when it came up in a, uh, we have regular catch-ups with Destination Gold Coast, Study Gold Coast and Major Events Gold Coast. And, and one of the topics of conversation that came up with them is that we all have our own international programs and we all have our own specific international markets that we target. So the idea of developing an international economic development program was about us getting more collaborative with those different organisations and making sure that the different events that we're going to have a direct connection to those sorts of markets that we want to target and that as much as possible each of those different agencies and all of those relevant external stakeholders are working together really collaboratively in those kinds of international opportunities. Um, I think from my perspective and having only been here for a year but the, the trip that we recently went on to the UK is probably the best example of that because Study Gold Coast, Destination Gold Coast and MEGC were all a part of that. So it's, it's trying to build on those sorts of opportunities to become more targeted in a collaborative way in the markets that we target so we can get greater bang for our buck essentially. Yep. Um, Mr Chair, there was just one outcome measure on page 33 I was just looking for clarification on. So there's an outcome measure in the talented section about a 22% increase in resident workers with a tertiary qualification. Um, what is the baseline for that at the moment? Through you, Mr Chair, there's a section at the end that provides a little bit more detail about the outcome measures. So yeah, on... so that's page 43. Yeah. So it just recites the same percentages but doesn't actually have a base. That's a total, what's the percentage? 22% increase is a big jump. 22% uh, increase in resident workers with a tertiary qualification. So starting from 201,000 to take it up to 244,000 in that sort of five-year mm. time frame. And how are we proposing to do that? Well, I mean, the, through you, Mr Chair, again, <coughs> there's a range of... It's increasing the number of people with tertiary qualifications is one way or one of the best ways that we can measure uh, that we're starting to generate the right sort of workforce to match the needs within industry. So, I mean, a lot of the things that are in the talented space, there are actions there that wouldn't be things that we would have direct control over. It's more about how we work with organisations like Study Gold Coast, how we can work with the universities. Uh, I had a great meeting the other day with the Australian, in uh, Australian Industry Trade College who deliver really tailored programs to the needs of industry. They're doing something currently with the marine industry. Uh, they're also looking to do something with the space sector. Um, so it's those sorts of partnerships and it's more about <coughs> our role and how we facilitate those partnerships to connect industry with education providers to try to make sure that the workforce is getting the right sorts of skills to be able to match the jobs that we require. So um, it's about <coughs> us trying to facilitate those kind of connections, Councillor Hamill. Mm. So it's probably a good segue into my next question, Mr Chair, but um, there was a broad consultation piece done around this work and um, a stronger emphasis than normal put on collaboration and engagement with private sector. So I was hoping Nick could give a little bit of um, maybe a general overview of, like, in this it's all wrapped up into one lot and it's a bit hard to differentiate what came from internal stakeholders versus what came yeah. from external, but maybe what you found to be the two or three main points the private sector was really looking for in this plan? Uh, through you, Mr Chair, probably the two that jump out to me the most is that talented piece. So, and you would all be familiar with this, but and because it's been going on well beyond just the consultation that we did around the development of this strategy, um, the challenges that industry are facing in getting access to a readily available, readily available and suitably skilled workforce. So access to a workforce um, mm. that is ready to go is probably one of the biggest challenges. And, and some of the businesses and industries out there that are doing quite innovative things, like I touched on before with the Australian Industry Trade College and the sorts of work that Study Gold Coast does, that's probably the biggest issue. Um, we've also been part of a, a jobs committee that um, <coughs> Gold Coast RDA has led, which is sort of looking at how government industry can work together around some of those solutions to do with fixing some of the job-related challenges. So 
that talented piece is probably the number one issue. But beyond that, that sort of connected piece is probably one of the other bigger things that industry spoke to us a lot about, was looking at how we can facilitate greater levels of connection, greater levels of opportunity for businesses to come together on a more regular basis. Um, a big part of the reason why the team facilitated Gold Coast Business Week this week, even though it's happened previously, was about providing those sorts of opportunities for business to come together again, to connect, to learn from interesting speakers, to share information and ideas together. Um, but, you know, that sort of connected piece into making sure that from a connected perspective, we also have the land and the infrastructure that's required to facilitate the growth around the jobs of the future and the industries of the future and, and things like that, which there's a, a number of different actions in there that relate to those things. So I think, um, I apologise, that's a pretty long-winded no, answer, well, but that's, that's, that's probably the, the main things that I recall coming from consultation and, and not just through that process, but as I said, through all the engagement that we've done with industry at different stages, you know, since those initial workshops. Hmm. Um, I don't think it was a long answer, Mr Chair. Actually, it was a good answer because it, it clearly pointed out there has been a, a lot of work done with dealing with private sector because in the end, we can only pull so many levers and if we're not prepared to genuinely work with them, which brings me to the next question was, is that there's a lot of detail in here about the need for that to continue in the future. Um, do you see that being an issue of how that kind of works, of continuing that approach of getting a stronger rapport and stronger collaboration from the private sector? Uh, through you, Mr Chair. No, I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's an issue. I think it's absolutely a priority for us because from my perspective, we've, we've always operated under the idea that if we're not engaging with industry and the sorts of things that we're doing are not informed by what industry is telling us, then we probably shouldn't be doing them in the first place. Everything that we should be do should be based on conversations and advice we get from industry. And there's a, a few different things in here. One is around the idea of a, an industry advisory group that we engage with on a, a more regular basis to give us greater level of information and connection to some of those different sorts of challenges that are being experienced in the local economy. So I guess that's a starting point, but I, I think that's something that we're really keen to embed in everything we do is that, that level of engagement with industry to ensure whatever we do is informed by information we're getting from industry. Um, Mr Chair, so looking at the appendix side of things, which goes in the greater detail of the measured outcomes that are in the, the strategy, I'm just interested, so in a few of the why is this a target um, columns, um, it refers to a conservative and achievable kind of goal, whereas in others it talks to one that's probably more of a, a reach goal on the push. So I was just interested if that, in Nick's opinion, um, as the author, but just on maybe f when it went through ELT or went through internal stakeholders or external stakeholders, if there were some of those targets he felt... Um, maybe we're a little bit low, that we should be looking to reach a little bit further or set slightly more ambitious targets? Through you, Mr Chair, I think we deliberately set targets that we were, you know, obviously hoping that we're going to be achievable, but I think part of the process is that we will have the opportunity on an annual <coughs> basis to review how we're performing against those targets. So if it looks like we're getting there quicker than expected, then we'll have the opportunity to potentially review those up so that we can, you know, grow them and expand on those if we need to. I think the other thing that I'm really quite um, <coughs> proud of, especially that um, the team in Avanka's area have developed, is... There's not too many economic strategies that I've come across that set targets that relate to things like gross regional product or how we're going to grow certain industries or the jobs to worker ratios and things like that. So, and the reason that most cities don't normally do that is because we don't, we clearly don't have complete control over each of those different outcome measures. So, but I think it's really important that we're identifying actions that can contribute towards those outcome measures and that we get to review those on an annual basis to make sure that we're working towards them really well. And if we need to increase them or if we need to also consider consider bringing them down, um, that we would come back to Council on an annual basis with that information. Mr Chair, I, I would agree with Nick's comments that, and compared to uh, the existing strategy that we're uh, possibly about to retire, there was one thing missing was there really wasn't much in the way of KPIs. It meant much. Um, there's definitely more in this one to measure success against. Um, on page, just in relation to page 46, so appendix three, the related city strategies, I was just wondering, Nick, if you had a conversation at all with our friends in water and waste about the solid waste strategy and some uh, information that came to light in the last round of water and waste committee about um, maybe a risk to the city of getting funding towards some of the um, circular economy projects because we're not part of Comsec. Has that been discussed at all? Uh, through you, Mr Chair, I'm 
not across a specific conversation around that one, but we have, we've got a working group established with water and waste at the moment that's looking at business attraction opportunities to do with, you know, waste and water and, and the broader circular economy. So I'm not across that one specifically, but we have established a pretty strong connection with them over the last sort of six months or so. So that's something that we can explore further and make sure that it's being considered as part of this whole process. I think, and, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, that would be good. That Just that one, that only just come through the last committee where we were, we were shown if, um, some information around a very large fund that's now available from the state government that is part of that process. Not being part of ComSec might be a problem for us. Okay. And just that in looking at identified risks for this strategy, that probably needs to be included. Um, the other one, and this might be a question, Mr Chair, either for Nick or for the Director around another risk I see in, in related strategies, number eight city plan and, and the current hold up with amendment packages and then the subsequent hold up of other ones because of that, of just how big a risk we see that being to this economic strategy. Whoever wants to have a go. Um, through you, Mr Chair. So, again, I don't see it. I mean, there's a lot of work that's going on in that productive Gold Coast space that's being facilitated by city planning, which they've been actively engaging us in that process, especially to understand those sorts of target industries and, and priorities. So I can't sort of comment at this stage. I suppose tomorrow I'll, I'll have to be able to comment. But... Um, <laughs> around the, the major <laughs> amendments. But um, at this stage, we've got a really strong engagement process in place with city planning and the rest of Alicia's directorate. So we're pretty confident that we can facilitate those sorts of outcomes, but I can't speak too much more, Alicia, to the risk. No, through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Hamill. I think from, if you look at the city planning space, what we've continually tried to do in the future is make sure that if there's amendments needed, so if we were looking at the strategy and we said, well, actually, that needs to change, that we're nimble, we're agile, we're able to do it. So everything that we've been leading to, particularly after Amendment 2 and 3, allows that. So I don't have any concerns with it. I think from an Amendment 2 and 3 perspective, wherever that lands, um, that's, that's not in, in with this particular yep. strategy. So it'll be those future strategies. And I think what we have done is set up a really strong process and, and work plan with the endorsement of council to ensure that we're able to be agile and we haven't got these really large amendment packages coming through again. Hmm. Uh, that is good to hear. And it is about, it's not so much amendment package two and three, it is the, the ones after that, which I think will look very different to what they were looking like a couple of years ago. Um, final question, Mr Chair, um, with this strategy and the implementation um, plans to come behind it, um, I think it's fairly obvious there's going to be a resource increase um, to come with it. Is there any level of detail available yet of what that resourcing increase might look like or when in the future we might be seeing that come forward? Uh, through you, Mr Chair. So we've um, we've obviously developed the, the plan on a page. We've done the sort of longer form version of the strategy. The team have also been working really hard on work plans around each of the different priority areas. Uh, and we've sort of mapped that out from a costing point of view. And the next stage for us really is understanding what impact that's going to have from a reasoning point of view, resourcing point of view. Uh, we're quite confident that we've got the funding available to implement what we need to implement. But it, the, probably the greatest risk to us is, is just whether we've got either enough resources or resources targeted in the right areas to focus on implementing all these things. So that's something that we are hoping to have completed um, over the next sort of month in all reality to be able to really determine where we're at in terms of how we resource any of the gaps that we don't currently have funding or resources to deliver. So it's something that we're working on and it's probably a month away at the most. I'm looking at the new acting manager, City Economy, to confirm yeah. that. But. So I guess, sorry, Mr Chair, um, we endorse a strategy and then possibly in a month's time you could turn around and say, you know, we don't have enough resources to do this. Um, what would possibly be the stuff that doesn't proceed for now or, or drop off? Like, how's that going to be determined? Uh, through you, Mr Chair. So anything anything to do with additional resources or lack of resources, we would bring back before committee. So committee and council was fully across of any of those sorts of challenges. Um, but I'm not anticipating that we will do necessarily any of that work in terms of additional resources until it fits into future budget processes. It's me now, Mr Chair. Um, no, good questions. I think... You know, Nick is always uh, pretty much on top of everything. So, uh, and are you sort of comforted by, by Nick's um, response? Oh, I definitely am by Nick's responses, Mr Chair. It's very obvious that he is well and truly across the brief on this one. 
um, for me, and this probably goes in a more general debate, but um, we've got the overall strategy. What's next is the actual plans for the implement it. Sure. There's lots of great ideas in here that I can support, but at the moment they're only words in a, in a document. It's what it actually looks like in practice for the next couple of years, um, especially for me the big one is around that stakeholder engagement with industry. Um, so we can only pull a few levers in this. So I'm more interested in what the actual strategies and plans to make this happen look like, which we really won't get to see for the next little bit. I'll just let Nick... Um... Yeah, and through you, Mr Chair. So one thing that we're, we've also spoken about as a team is that at the moment we have a tendency to primarily come to committee with items that relate to business attraction when we're seeking your endorsement for new businesses moving into the city. We, we actually want to come back to committee on a more regular basis with some of these different projects to seek your endorsement and to keep you in the loop on these sorts of initiatives so you're part of that process the whole way along. There's a lot of different initiatives in here that we won't be able to implement without your endorsement anyway, regardless of, you know, once the, hopefully the strategy is endorsed as the plan on the page, we would still need to come back to you for your, come back to you for your consideration of some of these initiatives anyway. As I say, I think it's definitely a priority for us to get in front of committee on a more regular basis with the sorts of things that relate to this strategy to make sure council's got full oversight over that. I'll just go to Councillor Tozer. <coughs> Questions, I'm happy to move the item if you like. Okay, uh, happy to move um, Councillor Tozer. Um, I'm, I'm happy to second, so, yeah. But um, if there's no more questions, i just go over to Councillor Tozer if you wanted to, to speak to it. Yeah, I mean, I think since the draft strategy has been discussed with um, councillors, there's no doubt that there is, um, you know, we've consulted widely, um, not just internally, but broadly across the, you know, the industry sectors that are important to us. And one thing in particular I really love is this idea of, you know, there has been a focus in our city about attracting other businesses who are successful elsewhere into the city, but there's a real um, understated opportunity of us helping businesses that are already located here growing and attracting the talent that they need to take their business to the next level. And, you know, in this strategy, that occurs to me as the, you know, a bit of a shift in ideology. And I see actually, actually a really exciting thing to think that, you know, businesses that have got maybe 10 to 50 or employees in the city, um, we're going to be providing resources and strategies and um, industry development programs that can help them attract talent here instead of a whole business having to relocate from another city to here to, to identify as Gold Coast. Um, you know, I think that's a, actually a really good part of the strategy and it, it, it's definitely something I'm really supportive of. So, Councillor Hamill. Um, Mr Chair, I'll, well, I won't be voting today, but when it comes to full council, I'll support it um, with a bit of an asterisk that um, I think it is a much better economic strategy than the previous one, mainly because it has much stronger and extended KPIs and, and measures of success. Um, I will be very interested to see in the first report that comes back in 12 months how we're tracking on some of those and we'll be looking to push some of them up on the ones that I think that we've been a little bit conservative on, but we'll let 12 months go. Um, I'm just gonna finish with one final comment on it, that a key part of the report talked about that the economic strategy has to give clear direction to the organization and to the market about what we're looking to achieve. I have uh, some concerns that we haven't been as clear as we could have been, that maybe we're still a little bit too broad, um, but, um, that can be another thing in 12 months time that possibly we go, well, let's, let's just sharpen this up a little bit more and be very, very clear to the organisation, to our uh, DGCs and MEGCs of the world and to the market about what we are really looking to tackle and tackle hard for the next few years. Um, and we'll just finish by saying that I think Nick needs to be commended and his team need to be commended on what they've managed to bring forward. Um, you know, with the new CEO coming on board with it did and the hold up and strategies, uh, it was a chance chance to go back and tidy a few things up and tighten things up a little bit, which I think has actually been really beneficial. Um, but there's no doubt that um, when Nick came on board, he had a big job to get this together in the time frame he did. So well done to him and his team. And um, I look forward to seeing the first results of it um, and hopefully it heads us in the right direction. Oh, well said, absolutely. And Tanya, as, as you say, and the team, and uh, beyond Tanya as well. So, so there's quite a few people been behind this. So um, yeah, you 
really have done a fantastic job, so I echo that. So. Councillor um, Toto, if there's no one else wanted to uh, to speak, I think you opened and closed. Uh, yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> okay. In which case, we'll uh, we'll take the vote. All those in favour? Um, that is carried. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, councillors, we have one more item. This item was originally uh, going to go to lifestyle and uh, community, and the and it was there was a, a, a need for this to actually come through uh, a bit quicker. So uh, that's why it's come here, um, and which and I think it should probably sit here anyway, personally. But there we go. It's another another matter. <laughs> 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 no, but anyway, so I was more than more than happy to to deal with this one. Um, so, Brooke, uh, do you want to wander out in case there's any? Yeah, I got Brooke and Libby there as well. So I didn't see Libby. No, hey, Libby. Um, yeah, look, th this, is, this is basically looking at the, the music action plan, which of course has uh, been in place for just a little under four years, and we basically lost a year of, uh, to everything with, with, with COVID, it had a big impact. So this is just looking at where we've gone over the last four years and uh, the goals we've kicked and, and where we're heading. So um, it's a really good report. I don't know... Uh, if it, would you like a presentation, just a quick overview? You would? Okay, so in which case uh, we would do that and we'll, looks like Libby's ready to, uh, yeah, open the batting. I am, and we've also got a video off the press. Oh, no, I didn't even know about the video. Hey, there we go. This has got boxing in Just turn this on. Thank you. Uh, that way? Yes. Okay. So the Music Action Plan was an inspired roadmap to help grow our local music industry. It was a foundational plan. It focused on grassroots actions that could really underpin a thriving music ecology. From this perspective, the plan focused on the upskilling of music businesses and artists, as well as provided funding for music businesses to grow, diversify and adapt. 
It looked at opportunities to grow the reputation of our music artists, venues and our infrastructure and was bold enough to suggest regulatory change to help live music remain front and centre in our fast growing, in our fast changing city. But I think most importantly, the plan identified what we as a council could do to help the industry. And the fact we had our hands up ready to take the lead, I believe that's probably the most impressive outcome that this plan has done and we've received a lot of a national recognition for doing that. Like many things, um, where you seek a major change, a lot of work is focused on the back end, um, and that's ongoing, definitely, with, with what we're doing at the moment as we aspire to be a live music-friendly city, one that's open for business. But the fundamental support the MAP provided businesses and individuals within the music scene in the Gold Coast is undoubtable, is undeniable. COVID-19 hit the music industry really hard and um, significantly impacted how the map was delivered as well, as Councillor um, LaCastra said. But as fate would have it, um, the music action plan framework that was in place made it much easier for us to adapt and pivot really quite quickly um, to offer timely and appropriate support where we could. We pivoted networking and support to online. Even our, some of our live showcases were, went to online through different platforms. We also could help artists grow their online merchandise product, which was an incredibly successful recovery program. We helped the industry open up again through the Feedback Festival and could refocus the music business grants to help adapt businesses to um, diversify and grow within the new normal that was existing with COVID. From a practical perspective, 25 actions of the 23 were either achieved or have commenced and are ongoing with ex expectation that they'll be finalised in the next financial year. A key example of that, of course, is the special entertainment precinct work and, um, you know, you will be hearing more about that in, in 823 coming up um, early, uh, mid-September. Um, this... Another example is the mentoring program that we're doing through the Australian um, Association of Australian Managers, which is ongoing. And in fact, the local managers are meeting their national mentors today down at Kira Hill. So that program is an incredibly important program and they're the sorts of things that we're looking to, to continue. But overall, there's some really great results. And the um, report actually lists some of those results um, in terms of very clearly under each of the actions. So I won't go through them as such, but if anyone wants to talk through any of those results or has any questions around that, um, it's probably now's the time to, to talk about those. It did any, obviously, the, the um, stats are looking really, really impressive as well. Um, I think the most important thing is, is that through all the different projects that the, the MAP could engage with, this includes all the funded programs that we did and all the grants, more than 175,000 people engaged with music or music related activities um, through the MAP um, funded um, activities. Um, and things like the 1,153 people um, who took part in skills and business development activities is incredibly important, as well as obviously during COVID, that support that went to our live music venues. All in all, we put in around $3.2 million into, directly into our local music industry over the last four years. That was made up of MAP-lined um, uh, uh, investment, but also, um, you know, there were other activities that came along. We had um, the RADF grants that, that contributed to that. We also had the, the music um, initiative line that we, we funded different activities through. And then, of course, that included the feedback festival funding that council endorsed um, and also the recovery program that was endorsed as well. So there was a lot of um, different investment that sort of laid on top of the original map project. So um, I think it's an incredible investment and I would struggle to think of another council in Australia who has invested in the same manner into its live music industry. So this report actually looks at what we do from here. Our music advisory group uh, met 
uh, in February with us to talk through what now. And I think there was a very clear message that they felt that given, I guess, COVID, but also, um, you know, there was so much good things that are put in place that the next two years be seen as a consolidated consolidation period where we can really embed some of this thinking and the way we do business into our BAU and our operational things. So um, we've thought about that in terms of how we um, structure that. We have got the music industry development officer um, through Helen Glengarry, who's who's here today. Um, and we're looking at that being called our Play Live um, Music GC office as such. And within her position, she'll be leading a lot of the different projects that we're hoping will continue um, to happen over the next two years, as I said, until we sort of really embed that into our BAU. So the open for business stuff, it, it, sort of the two main areas, there's a strategic catalyst sort of program, which is sort of things that are maybe a bit more newer and maybe won't have an ongoing life. And then the, oh, sorry, I'm trying to go back, but... Um, the open for business um, area are activities that we have done um, through the Music Action Plan and ones that we actually feel like will benefit the community if we continue. So they're things like we already fund the Gold Coast Music Network, which is a fantastic organisation that's come out through um, from the Gold Coast Music Awards and Blank Magazine. That is funded through our arts organisation, Chineal Funding, and obviously that will continue, but we will continue a really open dialogue with that organisation about how they go on to support the sector. Things like the Gold Coast Music Awards, which is happening on Saturday. Councillor Toza is presenting our Best New Release Award at that. Um, and that is a signature event that I think requires ongoing investment and we flagged it here as something that the city should look at as something that we continue to invest in. Things like big sound bursaries, we've got a um, 13 young or aspiring uh, professionals going up to Big Sound next week who are funded through the city. They will connect with Helen up there and also all different sorts of industry um, uh, functions and things that happen at Big Sound. So that is something, again, that I think that our city needs an active role in. Um, as I said, things like the mentoring program um, is already ongoing. Um, it goes for a year, the Walk This Way mentoring program. Our professional placement program is something that happens as part of our BAU, but we are still very much looking for music industry organisations to invest in placements. Song Hubs, such a successful program, Song Hubs Gold Coast. We're talking to Song Hubs about a potential April um, activity down at um, the Pink Hotel, where they are looking at having an international camp, an international songwriting camp, and really upping the ante on the profile of that for Australian songwriters and Gold Coast songwriters. So um, that's something we'd like to continue with. Gig Makers, um, that is a, um, a group of young people who were involved in putting on their first all-ages gig. We don't want to pull the pin on them just yet. We would like to continue supporting them. And we had a long discussion with the music advisory group about Activate Music, which is a special stream of funding that goes through RADF. And, you know, they have a really good point there. It really definitely helped highlight the opportunities that might exist for musicians much more than had ever happened before. And I think another two years of potentially providing a special stream that's music focused and gets funded and um, uh, separately, I think, um, would really benefit in terms of that transition. Then uh, one of the very exciting things that's come out of um, the map is our music industry digital toolkit. And I might show you that a little bit later, but that lives on our We Are Gold Coast um, site. Obviously, the special entertainment precinct. And we've been working across council, across all different departments, in terms of really understanding what outdoor 
multiple sites are appropriate for live music and we are looking at ways to standardise or help our industry and promoters to understand what types of ev events are appropriate for what kinds of sites. So there was five that was four plus maybe the Surface Paradise Beach that was identified and there's been some really detailed acoustic modelling being done there and draft music um, management, noise management conditions that are still progressing through the different areas of council but I think that's um, going to be a really important part of how we interface with the industry. From a strategic point of view, um, we've been doing a lot of work on the music um, infrastructure audit. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on cultural infrastructure audit um, and we were hoping that that might continue as to how our city progresses its profile about access, or well, basically it's about access, access to arts and culture, music through the current existing infrastructure that we have in this city. And I think it's a really important part. We know we've got Hodder. Hodder is a very important part of that, but all throughout the coast from north to south, that we've got infrastructure there that, that could really, um, that we can really work on from strategically to ensure that it, it meets the needs of cultural activation. Um, we also, of course, with market development, um, we really want to understand who our markets are for live music across the city. Um, our music industry development officer, Helen, has extensive experience in this space. And I think that kind of understanding of what kind of information and data we need to con collect, I think is important so that we can actually profile ourselves as a city who has an audience and we know exactly who that audience is and how to uh, reach them. Um, which is obviously a really important thing when industry is looking at touring to the Gold Coast. And um, being more proactive in that space in terms of market attraction um, in the live music space. And that, again, comes through Helen's experience in both um, live music outdoor sites but also within our um, existing infrastructure and how we work with industry to better at attract touring offerings. And projects here that aren't about the one-off, this is not about one-off um, events that might attract um, a different type of economic impact. It's about our audiences and our community being able to access their major acts that they love without having to go up to Brisbane. That's what this is about. As the Gold Coast becoming a significant part of the touring route um, and being able to um, live in that and play in that space quite professionally and comfortably. We are wanting to continue the work the city economy are doing, like even just in terms of what kind of businesses we're attracting to the city, especially in the Southport hub, to really capitalise on the special entertainment precinct. We have not had the chance to um, engage with national um, industry like we would have liked to have because of COVID, but we definitely have opportunities coming up almost immediately um, where we can invite international, national media um, in, um, industry to our city to experience um, live music um, and to understand who our artists are, who our audiences are, what kind of facilities we have. And that's a really big priority, I think, moving forward. Um, as Councillor Toza said, we also are working with um, Sound Pound to really embed our local music in our local music products. We've talked to Gold Coast, um, Destination Gold Coast about that, MEGC. Um, there's a lot of interest in that, and that's about having our own local music library, um, which has a rate card, and anyone who's interested in using our local live music in the space of um, promotional material, it becomes a lot easier easier with that kind of standardised offer that we can have and Soundpounder um, working with us on that and I think that's going to make a big difference as well. Um, and then of course we want to continue working nationally with the 
peak bodies that live and work and play in the industry. So peak bodies like APRA AMCOS, Q Music, um, and those sorts of um, industries, they are interested in having some sort of presence on the Gold Coast and we are interested in hosting them. Maybe it could look like at the Southport Community Centre they have a hot desk or they're there one day a month or so the industry can actually access this type of um, industry, national industry, peak bodies. That pretty much wraps up where we're thinking we would like to go over the next two years, as I said, to really consolidate the, um, the work that we've done with the Music Action Plan. Uh, and I, I guess I could finish the presentation. I'm just, we're just not quite sure how this actually works, but I don't know if you've had the chance to look at the toolkit yet that's online at the We Are Gold Coast um, website. So it sits, this is the We Are Gold Coast website, it sits under the business and invest um, and uh, look, um, Amanda's managed to get it. So it sits there under business in, and invest. So it basically is a one-stop shop that goes into um, what this city offers from a touring perspective. Helen describes it almost like a tour book that anyone who comes to the city would usually get it in a hard copy, but it sits digitally on our, you know, on our um, We Are Gold Coast. So if we go into why tour the Gold Coast, we have information about our demographic, we have information about our climate, our, um, our audiences, that sort of thing. Um, sits within that if you want to scroll down. Thanks, Amanda. The history, um, our audience profile, um, the types of environment we are, the fact that we're close to two international air, um, airports, that sort of thing. Um, if you go back into business and invest again, we go back to our, go back into there. Um, the venues um, page, this is this is not a toolkit for GP or um, general public. This is very specific to the industry who understands the type of language that is being used. So if we scroll down a little bit, Amanda, they can look at they can select venue type up there in the search engine. They can want they might want an intimate space, and then they might want something that is. Um, if you click on there, I'm just trying to think, uh, less than 1,500 capacity um, and that we know that Dust Temple comes up there and then they can, and the idea is it's not that we're dealing with, with information there, the information goes, once they click on Dust Temple, it goes straight to their um, website um, and straight to an email that Dust Temple have given us to, um, so that they can have that communication with the, um, with the interested party. Uh, we also have gone through a similar way with suppliers. So if we go back to, um, we go into suppliers. Um, how we did that was we did a 100 point system through procurement. We asked suppliers who've worked over the la in the last two years with um, major um, national uh, and local festivals or music events um, and they had to provide evidence of that and then they were able to list their um, list their services on this site and it's divided into whether they're an agent, a promoter, logistics or production. So again, it just really opens up that pathway into our local industry if anyone's wanting to understand what we offer. The same thing with accommodation, we go straight to the Destination Gold Coast um, website uh, and if you just click on that again, I'm just trying to think what else we've got there. Um, and we list obviously our initiatives and support that we offer um, and that's where anything that goes up there that might exist, for example, um, with the um, structure and governance review, if there's any initiatives or packages that might exist to um, attract these types of um, events to our city, that's where that would live. There's information for residents site there as well, which once we understand what our, our outdoor site's going to look like, um, we are able then to have direct communication with our residents. We might be able to put a link directly to here. So if you've got someone who lives next door to Boardwater Parklands and Helen always uses the example of they're having their dad's 80th birthday 
birthday party on the 10th of May, this is the website where they could look in, know that they're affected resident when, when it goes into event mode um, and be able to understand whether or not there's going to be something on in that space. So it's, it's very specific to do with those particular sites that are really earmarked for live music as such. Um, it gives us that opportunity. So it's an ongoing thing. That's why we made it digital. It will continue to change as the city really starts to really formalise and finalise our approach to live music and the industry. Um, it gives us a fantastic skeleton, I guess, to start working with. Um, and it's, yeah, I think it's going to be incredibly successful. Um, at, you know, as, as, a, as a toolkit moving forward in terms of the industry uh, working with us. So, I might get out of that now, unless there's any questions. So that was the end of the slideshow. Um, did anyone have any, should I take any questions through you, Mr. Chair? So um, first thing I want to say is just to give a bit of feedback about a couple of the programs we've run um, that councillors may not be across. I, I had a call uh, just the other day from an accountant in my area who had been given a big sound bursary because they work almost exclusively with the music industry. And, you know, it might not front of mind, I think we see things, something like big sound bursaries, we think, well, it's a young emerging musician. But in this case, it was actually, a mus it was actually a, an accountant a qualified accountant, CPA, who has mm. been working almost exclusively with the music industry mm. and had been given a bursary to help build her clientele and her exposure to industry practice in the area of mm. accountancy. And I think that's something that's understated in the music industry. Um, the fact that those bursaries to Big Sound and, and a big music conference like that, which is effectively a business conference relating to the music industry, yeah. um, is not just helping young musicians, it's actually helping people who serve service providers of the music mm. industry. Um, so I suppose I wanted a positive feedback. You did really good there, well done. Thank you for making sure that those bursaries went not just to musicians, but to people who are serving mm. the industry. The other thing is I got a bunch of great feedback about the program that you didn't mention today, but there's a program where you partnered local musicians with um, fashion and designers, where it was a merch project. Yeah. So when COVID hit, one of the biggest challenges that a lot of musicians had is they couldn't sell tickets to gigs. And so they had to find different ways to generate revenue and, mm -hmm. and merchandise, hats, shirts, merchandise was one of the things. And that program, um, I think, you know, there was definitely a lot of high fives around the place saying, actually, that was a really good initiative that, that actually partnered designers in the fashion industry with the music industry in a place where both industries actually needed a bit of strength and the, that the music action plan and the, the, the groups involved in the programs we've been delivering have not just grown, you know, a young young musician trying to write a song and be famous, uh, but actually built industries that serve the music industry. I think it's been really positive. So two big positive feedbacks mm. there. Um, the other thing I think, I think we can do better when it comes to that licensing space. I'm really mm. encouraged that you're um, bringing music licensing and ensuring that our production, our city's production of the work that we're doing in live music is actually engaging um, experienced and credible practitioners without wanting to be negative. The video we showed before, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. There are much better, there's mm. much better um, music the video artists, producers. Yeah. yeah, and also using royalty-free stock, like royalty-free music. I appreciate there's budget constraints on your department, mm. but mm. the fact that we used effectively a royalty-free stock instead of a Gold Coast musician. It, it was a Gold Coast musician. But... Oh, electronic musician. Right, okay, cool. That's, and that's great, but I didn't see, I'm not sure I saw a credit. So on the video that had the backing... Should have had a credit, yeah, credit. for sure. Should have acknowledged mm, the, mm. the person. And, and to me, maybe that's a product of... Maybe that's a product of the production process for the video that we made. Um, we should credit the people that we include in there and they should be... If they, particularly if they haven't been paid, um, yeah. we, sh we should credit them throughout the whole thing in the bottom right-hand corner or somewhere just to make sure that we are, you know, appropriately acknowledging the body of work that's gone into creating new music. So through you, Mr um, Chair, it was Kai Grant and the track was myself and we paid appropriately licence fees for it. So. Wonderful news. Yeah. Um, it would be awesome <laughs> Maybe not everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, that, no, 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 it's good. Awesome. Um, two things I wanted to add or questions I wanted to add. In the live music toolkit, um, I noticed that the venue capacities are kind of mutually exclusive. Mm. 
so under 1500 only included the dust temple only just for my birthday i went it's a to glitch. councillor patterson's <laughs> division and, yeah. and frequented the vinnie's dive bar and it was very exciting but clearly that is a venue that is under 1500 um, and if we're going to do that, one of two things need to happen. We either need to not be mutually exclusive about the capacities or we need to include a lower end to each category. So it would be 500 to 1,500. So there is a 500 where Vinny's dive bar oh, comes up. Yeah, yeah, but it is a, a glitch that we've picked up that if you go above that, you want both you categories to come in, but they don't. So that's something that we're looking at with the web designers at the moment because I agree. It, yeah. It's sort of, it, yeah, yeah. To me, it's a database yeah. thing. You either yeah. include all of them that are in the smaller category or you put a lower end capacity in the the metric or whatever the database field is that, that shows yeah. the venues. Um, yeah. Did want to say that I think once we as council start broadcasting that, it probably is incumbent on us to engage with Alicia's team to ensure that they're um, appropriately uh, permitted to... Permitted. Uh, so that there is a land use approval for that capacity in that venue. Now, I love the Dust Temple. All right. And I have been there with a lot of people before, but I would be really interested to make sure that the information we're putting out there is accurate in accordance with the land use approval that each venue has because all that will do is it'll create dramas for councillors who get complaints and they deal with development compliance complaints. It's probably good for us to reconcile that across... I don't want to over-regulate, but also it's important because we're providing that information, let's make it be aligned with our own um, permissions. Thank you. Uh, the last one I had is, Ken, in the, in the event list that you showed us, it was chronologically ordered by oldest to youngest... Event list. Or oldest to most recent or old, like the, the oldest event was at the top. If we could just reverse that order so that the old events appear at the bottom of the page instead of the top of the page. Oh, I see what you're saying in the in the toolkit, yep. Yeah, so yep. just that even if you just go to the screen behind the thing there, there it is. So yep. Good Love Festival is in May mm -hmm. and then you've got May and then you've got mm -hmm. June and then you've got May. I mean, there's, there's some, yeah, there must should. be some way to order that so that the most Good um, idea. either recent event or the, the, the most, you know, uh, I don't know, like 2023 should come before 2021. Yeah. Um, so so these are very the most current things. And, yeah. and I appreciate this, this yeah. toolkit is very new. It's fresh. It's only just mm. kind of not mm. that long been out. But these are very but practical things that, yep. that we need to be right on the ball with mm. because – the one thing about the music industry and particularly patrons is that they're ruthless. Mm. <laughs> and if they don't get the information that they need when they mm. need it mm. or the information is irrelevant, they will stop using it immediately because there are better sources of that information. Um, I'm super excited about the Gold Coast Music Awards on Saturday. I hope every councillor who can possibly make it would come along and cheer. And if you don't, then pick up the Spotify playlist for Gold Coast Musicians and just give it a listen. Thanks, Libby. Thank you. Thank you through you, Chair. Um, thank you very much. And I'm also um, very keen on this plan and what it can do for our city. Um, I do have a couple of questions around areas that I do have a bit of a concern. And this is regarding your strategic catalysts, where you identified three strategic catalysts of places, market development and reputation. So places I'm fine with. Market development, when you're talking about your citywide arts and culture survey, I'm just wondering how much of that, um, I know Hodder's just gone through a, re a similar process. I assume placemakers have done a similar process. How much uh, engagement is there between our entities so that we're not doubling up and doing the same work? Mm -hmm. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this references, I guess, our, our citywide um, survey that we've done since 2017, 2018, before the Commonwealth Games, and looks to have additional, a couple of additional questions around music as being one of our signature art forms. Um, there is a question at the moment with um, all the changes as to whether that survey is going to go ahead from a resident. It goes through, have your say, and it was right. expected to go through in September. So um, I'm not quite sure whether it will proceed as an individual thing, but I take your point, and as you say, we might be yeah. able to, if it doesn't, um, 
piggyback onto something that either HODA or MEGC does through their culture counts and their different surveys that they do as well to yep. really get that understanding. I think the 2019 one gave us this really encouraging figure that 81% of residents um, attended a live music concert in the previous year, which was in a really high percentage. So that kind of information, I guess, really helps understand what our audiences, what our public and residents are doing and what they're interested in, so. I would say on that though, through the chair again, and I've raised this numerous times, GC Have Your Say has a place, but in terms of rigorous methodology and knowing whether that's accurate information about our residents, it does not provide that. So I think, I think this does need to be, I mean, just from the conversation with Hara, I do get a sense that this is all being siloed at the moment. It's great timing with the mm. entity yeah. review and I think it's just one of the things to take on. My second question I think I probably would need to go to, into closed for because it relates to um, uh, contracts with um, providers and venues um, budgetary reasons. I just don't think that I can I can raise the questions in open. Is it something that that actually relates to this? Because we're just looking at yeah. basically updating the plan as such, rather than it. It's a question I'd like to ask, and I think this is an appropriate place to ask it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just looking at, can we just bring up those recommendations again? Sorry, please. The other thing is if I raise it as a GBI, but it is kind of related to this. Yeah, I just want to make sure that it, if you think it fits into this, we can do that, but this really okay, is just I'll to update look. us where we're going and saying we're going to keep moving forward with it and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but if you're sure that it fits in with this, we can go into close, but I'm, I'm not convinced till I hear it, so. Um, if it's for uh, commercial incompetence uh, reasons, we can do that, but I do want to make sure that it tightly relates. Okay. You're sure it does? Okay. Then, hang on, um, hang on. <laughs> no, it's... Um... Yeah. Because we're really only looking at, as I say, reprovision of funding and just... It was related to something that was provided in the presentation, though. I would, I would suggest, from what you're saying, that maybe it might be a good idea to actually do that out of the meeting, and if need, okay. and if need be, um, you can raise, you know, you can raise a general business item later or send through a. It's, a, it's kind of, not, a, not it's also urgent. It's also time sensitive. So, um, I don't know. Sorry, I hadn't thought about this earlier, how to do it. So, it might be best I raise it as a GBI. Yeah. Thank you. I, th I, th I think it might be. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll just move on to Councillor Owen Jones. Uh, thank you. Uh, about three hours ago when you were talking, um, you said <laughs> you talked about a songwriting camp or, or session in that regards. Is that in partnership with any of the publishing houses? Through you, um, Mr Chair. That is in partnership with APRA AMCOS, who are basically the licensing body that deals with all the publishers and sort of is the peak body yeah. for that in Australia. So they work with... Hmm. They work with all the um, publishers and licensing bodies across Australia, um, and they're the peak body that coordinates all of that. Yeah, um, and the reason why I ask is, Mr. Chair, my understanding is Mushroom Publishing, which are probably one of the larger in Australia, have a annual songwriting mm -hmm. camp, which mm -hmm. is Victorian based, and I was particularly interested if we'd ever looked at either borrowing. Uh, that camp, or alternatively, <laughs> doing a satellite, yep. or in in partnership, effectively with the business, mm. as opposed to the peak with body. The peak, oh well, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. and it still is. So it's the sun now runs it. But like I mean, is in it, and they would partner um, established songwriters with up and coming and all of that type of thing. And and that to me seems like good good business for us to be in. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then my only other comment is an observation in regards to the soundtrack that we listened to with the video that I think that we probably um, could make it a little bit more lively than what we did because mm -hmm. that to me actually sounded like it wasn't locally produced and that we borrowed it from an elevator. Okay. I have to say exactly the same thing. Yeah. Small dance party in a elevator. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Libby. Um, all right. Yeah, okay, I think we're, we're done for questions. So, move to Councillor Tozer, second to Councillor McDonald. Um, do you like to speak to that? Uh, look, there is no doubt there has been an immense body of work go into um, growing the Gold Coast reputation as a place where music is celebrated. Uh, both the industry of music and obviously the creative process of music. Um, you know, the, the, the success of this action plan and, and the, the program of work that we've undertaken is evidence not just in how the local community see um, the council's support for their industry, but the mm -hmm. fact that increasingly we're seeing larger acts um, decide to, um, you know, base a, base a tool here. And it's, it's finding a balance between those two things that I think is critically important with the plan. Um, it is not just about attracting big name acts into our city for the economic impact. It's actually about a thriving creative industry that partners with other um, sister and brother industries to grow a bunch of creative, effectively creative design um, skills and talent in our city. Um, that creative design skills and talent isn't just about musicians, it's actually about graphic designers, it's about um, architects, it's about, um, f you know, fashion, uh, it's, it's about all these industries that are, I think the Gold Coast ha has already been, always been really good at, but we've never really kind of cohesively, coherently kind of championed those causes um, as collectively as we are doing now. Um, the Music Action Plan is, is super, it's super exciting to see it grow in the way that it has. Um, the only thing I'd, I'd probably just say is that you know, it is important that we remember um, that uh, that the big music industry companies are very commercial in nature, and it's wonderful that they employ lots of people, but they are also relatively ruthless. The music industry has a reputation of being ruthless, um, and it's important that we know when we're engaging with those big entities, they don't always look after um, our emerging musicians in the way that perhaps they could. Um, and I think that we have a stewardship role as a, as a city council who cares deeply for its people, that we um, lift up those emerging, emerging musicians, make sure they're paid appropriately, paid well, and that we um, help them skill up to um, increase their kind of hourly rate. Um, and that, that could be something that we can do because mm -hmm. the commercial market will always try to kind of push some of those down and they're into, into making sure that they, they are profitable. Um, and they should be, but we, we can play that role filling the gap um, as those musicians build up. And, and the best example I can, I can give you is that, you know, Amy Shark's now touring the world. She's done 65 dates through Australia and she's toured the US. And, you know, one of her first, um, you know, first prominent activities was a, a music video funded by the City Council that ultimately won her a Queensland Music Award. Um, before she was super famous and signed by Sony, she parted with her local government to deliver a piece of media that ultimately started a platform or started a journey for her. Um, and we sh that, that's the place that we should be. Um, we should be helping those emerging musicians find a little bit of... Um, find a good platform to, mm -hmm. to build themselves up so, so, they, so that we can grow the industry. And then, you know, right now we couldn't buy the marketing of Amy Shark across Australia and the US telling every single person that she comes from the Gold Coast and that she's proud of it. Um, I think that's a really positive thing and it's something that we as a, as a council should be proud of and this Music Action Plan um, definitely is a catalyst for that sort of investment. We also Second. have the number one and two Australian country music albums at the moment. We do. It's amazing. It's awesome. Long live Sanctuary Code, the home of Australian country music. Yes. <laughs> you know. But it's not just about the musicians. It's sorry, have you finished? I mean, no, I have. That was the opening statement. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's could have been closing as well. It's not just about musicians. It's about you know, it's about venues. It's making it easier for those venues to perform. It's yeah. um, engaging with the community. I mean, it was a very interesting statistic looking at that, with saying that something like eighty-one uh, percent 
of Gold Coast has had attended a live music event mm. in, in 2019. Obviously, you know, COVID hit after that. But, but again, it just means that it's not just those big events. It's not just, you know, Blues on Broad Beach. It's not groundwater. It's, I mean, we've now got Springfest coming up as well. But it's just having those venues for locals to go out and go, great, where can I go and see some, some great live music? And, uh, um, and obviously, it's a it's it's a big thing for bringing tourists in to have great live mu live music. People want to go out. They want they they want to do that. They can do that in other cities. Up until now, they there weren't many venues where they could do that. It's the networking. It's the development. You just say the musicians. It just works on every level. And it's um, considering we've been through such a difficult time mm -hmm. uh, to have delivered 23 of those 25 key. Um, well, I suppose we can call them KPIs, really. I mean, this uh, is, is quite exceptional. So, um, uh, and, and again, a lot of thanks, as we've said here in this uh, recommendation too, needs to go back to the music advisory group, to, you know, to Dean Gould and his team and, and for everything they did. So um, it's, it's a good news story, isn't it? Mm. It's a, and, and I agree with everything Councillor Tozer said. I mean, as you say, it's, it's dovetailing into other industry, industries as well. It's it's not just about the musicians, is it? It's everything. It's um, it's a great story. Councillor Gates. Uh, Chairman, I know we're in debate, but I just wondered through you if the officers could provide us a split of the how the funding is to be apportioned. There's a... On page 55, there's a list of um, existing funding sources. But just by email before full council, if we could have a split of how those funds are going to be apportioned, please. I can. Thank you. All right. Um, anyone else wanted to add anything? I might go back to Councillor Tozer to, to close. This weekend is Springtime Festival. It's the first time we've held an event, uh, a festival um, of this nature, and particularly in this genre. Um, yes. Normally, these sort of this sort of genre festival is is funded by other commercial entities. But but on the bill this weekend are a bunch of Gold Coast artists um, partnered with a bunch of other amazing um, artists that get regular play on Triple J, and we're hoping that there'll be a bit of a young crowd out and about. But I know that there's a bit of music for everyone. The Gold Coast Music Awards on Saturday afternoon. Uh, it's on at about I think the, the award ceremony is about 1:30. Throughout that event, there'll be I think there's six different genres of music and performances during that event. Like it's it's really a diverse genre piece. And then if if you know the music of Triple J or you know an award ceremony isn't your cup of tea, I think Lily Grace is playing a country set for a Cancel Owen Jones down at the Burley Bazaar. Um, so if country music is your cup of tea, there's plenty of places to see that as well. Um, yeah, this weekend. All right, nice. No <laughs> Easy listening is also really good. <laughs> All right, councillors, we <laughs> take the vote on this. All those in favour, that is uh, carried. Um, councillor, sorry, councillor Owen Jones. Yeah. Um, so, Bob, I'm not a member of your committee, but I would like to have a chat about uh, a general business item that doesn't relate to music, but might relate to super yachts. To super yachts. Uh huh. Well, your concert Saturday night. Yes. All right. So, do you mind? No. Um, what so about if I move the item for you and then you speak to it? I'd like to move. You ready to go? That a this is. We'll bring it to you shortly. Yeah. That a report be prepared in consultation with the Gold Coast Waterways Authority. That one identifies the existing number and locations of super yacht berths. Thirty metre. 30-plus metres, yeah. 30-plus metres. And two, um, identifies the opportunities for additional temporary and permanent berths for super yachts on the Gold Coast. Second. Now, it may not sound like either entertainment or tourism, but I reckon it's definitely economic development. Yes. Um, and so, Mr Chair, you're probably more than aware that this week we've got the Gold Coast Business a Week and there's been an, a number of presentations and yesterday morning I attended a presentation uh, with city officers and the city CEO um, at the Southport Yacht Club where um, one of the speakers was from the there's a peak industry body which is surprisingly called Super Yachts Australia. Um, and uh, and he spoke, and so too did Chris from the Gold Coast Waterways Authority, and it was and it was really um, just in regards to the data that the super yacht uh, peak body has collected in recent times. So in 
2018 prior to COVID, there were 59 vessels that um, had come to Australia uh, as super yachts. In 2021, that had increased to 120 vessels. And the economic impact for Australia was $2.4 billion. Um, and in order for the Gold Coast to be in that space, I think that we would definitely benefit from taking stock of... Yeah, definitely take stock from identifying what we had at the moment in regards to super yacht birds. So clearly the city's invested $5 million and, and a bit more in a very 110 metre long berth at Southport Yacht Club, but there has to be other opportunities. Um, in terms of uh, super yachts, uh, in, in terms of the international market, and in the last 20 years, the numbers have increased from 2,163 vessels to just under 6,000 vessels uh, internationally. Um, and I think that our city needs to be as, as close to the front as possible at snaring as many of these uh, vessels visiting our coast. And they estimate in... 2032 for the Olympics, they are expecting to have at least 200 of them in southeast Queensland. So, which is why I'm interested in in what identifying the temporary birds, and the longer that we can have them coming to Australia and staying preferably close to the Gold Coast, the better we'll be for our industry. How many can we fit in Emerald Lake? Sorry. Just a question through you to Alicia. Should it say that the manager, ED, MP or whatever the title is, prepare a report rather than just a report be prepared? Should we identify where this should go? Through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Gates, we can do that. If it's the way it is, that's self-explanatory yeah. too. But we could always say that the Director, Economy, Planning, Environment, prepare a report in consultation with. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But either way, it's it And I think fine. it's a report that probably... Does is probably better served at the moment in this committee than planning because I think it actually is about... And it's not about us saying that the city needs to get into the business of building more super yacht birds, but um, an example was provided yesterday in regards to the state government's plans for the spit um, and one of the property developments where, there where the developer was seeking to do something other than a, um, a berth uh, on the spit, and that's the, the single most logical place to actually make sure that we actually don't lose um, uh, available birthing opportunities for the... Because it's not about necessarily the tourism industry, it's actually about the five or 6,000 people at um, the Coomera Marine Precinct and the couple of thousand people at Hope Island who are actually working in the industry, uh, servicing those vessels. Uh, so, yeah, it's actually 30 metres and it's not a square. Sorry, that was my mistake. All right, so Councillor Gates, are you going to move on? I'm simply moving it. Yeah. I don't need to speak to it, certainly. Yeah, but we need to second it, so second it. All right, no, no, I agree. It belongs here, uh, absolutely. So. They just need to get the mover and the seconder up. So, Councillor Gates uh, and oh, seconded okay. Councillor Tozer. Oh, gee, on the Thank ball. You. There we go. Welcome, All right. William. So, uh, in which case, yeah, there's no need for any further discussion. I think Councillor Owen Jones has uh, spoken to it, explained it all, and I'm um, sure it's going to be supported. All those in favour? That is carried. And Councillor Patterson? Uh, no. No? Okay. OK, all right. Um, what I did want to say was um, uh, this is actually the last meeting that uh, Alicia will be sitting in. I mean, it's terribly, terribly sad. She's, well, she's not exactly leaving us and going very far, but she is leaving us for bigger and better things. So, yeah. Yeah. Mr Chair, I've got a few presents at Planning Committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's in the mail, it's in the mail, yeah, it's so slow, I'm sorry. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, so, what was that? Oh, you can never run out of nice things to say about Alicia. There's too many nice things, you can never run out. So, uh, so Alicia, of course, is going off to uh, City Operations to be uh, director there, and so, um, but thank you so 
much. Uh, Thank you, your, Mr. Um, yeah, your expertise will be sorely missed, but then you're just going to get expertise in other areas now. You seem to be collecting expertise from, Co collecting them. from everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Very well rounded. There isn't anything you can't do. <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, no, and we all look Thank forward you. to supporting Alicia in her new role. Absolutely. Here, here. And yeah. we look forward to Nick taking up the responsibilities. <laughs> yes. It's, you've left it in very capable hands with Nick. So, uh, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Mr. So, Chair. Zara can stay that. where she is. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I, I mean, I said it last week at planning, but thank you to committee councillors for your support of our team. And certainly I know this is a joint committee with um, Lifestyle and Community as well. So certainly appreciate the support. And it's an interesting committee. It's obviously got a, a bit of a mixed bag in terms of what we take up, but appreciate that. And I think our, our teams do a very good job and they will continue to do a very good job. And I look forward to watching the success of the committee. <laughs> You'll be tuning in every I'll be tuning like, in, absolutely. You wouldn't want to miss it. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Meeting closed. Okay. <laughs>